You know what they say. Drunk words are sober thoughts. Get a little tequila in your system and you have liquid courage. Today's episode, we're going to introduce y'all to something called Pickwid Courage. I deserve to be canceled after that one. This list that we have today, six players that I would have to be drunk in order to draft in 2022. All right? It's probably not what you think. You know, it's not that I'm so drunk that this pick was terrible. It's more like I really want to draft this guy, but I'm not courageous enough. All right. I need that pick with courage. I need to be drunk. I'm a coward. OK, these are guys that I want to go out on a limb and take a chance on, even though they just might be horrible players. But I want them. I want them bad in 2022. So today we're going over six players that I would need to be drunk in order to draft this year in fantasy. You all know what to do next. Got to tuck our shirts in. Got to stop yelling. It's time to eat, baby. And just a quick reminder, our season-long draft guide is live on August 1st. You can pre-order it right now on bdge.co, but the easiest and the least expensive way to get it is by going to Prize picks, prizepicks.com or using the link below will take you straight to the app store. And when you deposit $10, $10 or more, and you use the promo code BDGE, they're going to 100% deposit match you as well as give you access to our draft guide for free. All right, prizepicks.com. Go check it out. Use promo code BDGE. Zach Wilson can use a little BDGE in his life. He can use maybe a little less Cougar, a little more uh, BDGE. All right, this man put the dub in Wilson this week, last week, whenever those rumors started spurting off. Outside of that nonsense. Zach Wilson was atrocious at times last year, all right? So it's very easy to make fun of him. Very easy to make fun of that pick. Very easy to just make fun of the Jets, right? Low-hanging fruit. We're not going to do that, right? I kind of want to draft Zach Wilson this year. I kind of want to draft him. I don't know if I have it in me to do it, though. Like, at times, it felt like he was an auto bust last year. Five weeks into the season, they were like, this is the worst pick I've ever seen. He got better down the stretch, though. A lot of rookies come in, and they have turnover problems off the rip. We saw that with Zach Wilson. But over the first six games of the season, 1.5 interceptions per game. Last seven games of the season, 0.29 interceptions per game. He dealt with some injuries. It was a wonky season, but he clearly started taking care of the ball more and more as the season progressed. And I'm not saying he was a good fantasy player by any fucking stretch of the imagination, but rookie quarterbacks need to get the foundation correct. And he started to do that towards the end of the season, taking care of the ball more. Regardless about Zach Wilson as a player, though, the Jets have done everything they can possibly do to let us know whether or not Zach Wilson is good. Like any other quarterback in this situation would thrive, okay? I'm just not sold on Zach Wilson as a talent. I want to draft them though because they've improved their offensive line to the point where they were like one of the worst offensive lines in the league for a long time. They are now like the number 13th ranked offensive line per PFF. I think they're only going to increase that because there's a lot of young talent on the offensive line. I mean, they got Elijah Moore. They drafted Garrett Wilson. Corey Davis as the three. Got Brees Hall, Michael Carter in the backfield with the O-line. CJ Zoma got some athletes at the tight end position. If he doesn't get it done this year, man, it is, it's only his fault because they have everything there for him to get it done. I might be taking some Zach Wilson, but only if we have tequila in the system. Number two on this list, we are staying in New York slash New Jersey. Daniel Jones of the New York Giants, man. And I have absolutely no idea why I still have faith in this man. Um, it's been a make or break year for Daniel Jones basically every year that he's been in the NFL so far. And it breaks every time. It's make or break and it breaks every time. But, but there's some, some good things going for him. He's got the improved offensive line. He's got the new system under Brian Dable. Good weapons group, man. Kadarius Toney, Kenny Galladay. I don't know if Shep will be back or not. Um, Saquon, obviously, in the backfield, man. He's got some things going for him. And m probably most importantly, a Jason garrett list offensive system going on here, man. And we know Jones is a pretty good runner of the football. He's an athlete. He can make things happen on the ground when the rest of the shit breaks down. But he probably won't need to run as much. And he probably won't be under, you know, one of the biggest problems, like I was talking about with Zach Wilson, is his turnovers were crazy the first three years that he's been in the league. With a better offensive line, which they do have now, they also went from one of the worst to a top half of the league offensive line. Andrew Thomas was horrible his rookie year, turned into one of the best pass blocking tackles in the NFL last year. It was a 180 degree swap. It was a, wait, yeah, 180. I thought I did the Jason Kidd thing when he's like, we're going to do a 360 degree turn, end up right bike where you are. That's, that's Daniel Jones' career in a nutshell. But listen, they have a lot of improvements going on here in New York. They have a new system. I think he's been kind of set up to fail the first three years, whether it was really poor offensive line, really poor offensive scheme, also like an ungodly amount of injuries to the talent there for the big blue. So hopefully if things break right this year, 
he can get a fair chance at it. I'm not hopeful that he is the, the QB of the future for the New York Giants. Ain't no fucking way. Ain't no way. But I'm hopeful that he could be okay for fantasy this year, and I might just draft him as my QB2 in Superflex leagues. Number three on this list, Javonta Williams, man. Javonta Williams, I want to take him in the second round of fantasy drafts so bad, but there's just, with them re-signing Melvin, there's just no way he becomes a, a league-winning player, right? Like, there's no way he just takes over the entire backfield unless, unless, here's the problem. Melvin was legitimately good last year, right? I don't care about the money that they gave him. He was good, and if he's good on the field, they're going to play him. They do have the new offense and system in there, but they also did just fucking resign him, so they know how valuable he is to this team. But again, Melvin was was good, not just volume good. He wasn't just like, oh, they gave him too many carries, therefore it accumulated yards for him. We'll rip off some stats for him from last year. Number 11 in rushing yards, number 8 in touchdowns, number 7 in overall evaded tackles, number 9 in elusiveness per touch. I mean, he's he's 29, so he's old, but some guys, some running backs play late, man. It's, it clearly wasn't a problem for him last year. It's so hard to know who's going to get what role in this offense when it comes to this backfield, right? Both guys had exactly nine goal line carries last year. So for you to lean one way or another would be pretty ignorant because it's literally a 50-50 split from last year. Williams had more targets, which is good to see, but it wasn't a huge gap. It was 53 to 40. Russ Wilson, obviously coming over as a quarterback, not historically a guy who checks down to running backs a lot. So it's hard to say that the volume will be, even if Williams takes more of a share of that, it's hard to say that the volume numbers will be higher. So he might get the same amount of targets, maybe even fewer this year with Russ Wilson under center of quarterback. But third downs, though, this is where I'm encouraged by Javante, man. Third downs, it was it was Javante. He graded out as a better blocker as well. Um, he was just much more efficient on his touches, especially from a, a rushing perspective, but a receiving perspective as well. The volume was more in favor of Javante Williams. So he, he was just way better in third downs. And I think that will be his role. So he's got the edge just about everywhere, except the goal line split is about 50-50. Here's the thing about that, though. Like, even if they split at 50-50, 55-45 in favor of Javante, this offense is going to be so much better that the opportunities down there should, you know, rise all tides. Tides all rise. I'm going to shut my mouth, but y'all get the point. All right? I think I just talked myself into Javante. I didn't even think I needed to be drunk. I think I just needed to be caffeinated, possibly. So Javante is the number three guy on this list where I'm just like, I really fucking want to take him in the second round, but the Melvin thing just makes me not courageous enough to do it. Oh, man, we got to keep moving down this list to this player, huh? Miles Sanders, running back of Philadelphia. When I talk about Miles Sanders, I imagine it kind of feels like whatever girl Drake wrote the song Shot For Me for, that's how she feels when she hears that song, you know? I wrote a little version of it myself, you know? Miles, I'm honest. I can't lie, I miss you. You on the Austin Eckler were picks at the turn for round one and two. That was it. That was all I had for you. I tried to do the first line. Y'all remember back in the day, Miles Sanders, 112, Austin Eckler, 201, saved my season. Thank God for Austin Eckler. Rough scene out here. Very rough scene out here for me right now. All right, let's talk a little football, eh? I mean, it's personal for me, man. It's fucking personal for me, and I don't know if I can ever pick him with a straight face. But if I'm drunk, I can make the pick because I think he might be a good fantasy football player this year. All right, the case for Sanders to go sideways is a very easy one to make. His entire career has basically gone sideways at this point. What's another notch in the belt here, right? But I still think he can be good, man. This offensive line is legitimately ranked the number one offensive line for PFF going into the 2022 season. All right, Jordan Howard is gone. That might open up a little more goal line work. Miles Sanders actually got a lot of the goal line work this year for the running backs. The problem with that being like, yo, Miles Sanders had, you know, 70% of the goal line carries while he was healthy among the running backs is like, but Jalen Hurts had like 14 or 15 goal line carries. So it's being like Tony Pollard got a decent amount of goal line carries, but Zeke is still there to take 15 goal line carries. Like it's the same thing. Just because he's a quarterback doesn't mean his goal line carries don't count against whatever you're going for. So I don't really know what's going to happen there, but he's one of the bigger backs on the roster now with Jordan Howard gone. And as long as Jalen Hurts doesn't completely unravel, which he was fine last year, and now they added A.J. Brown, they have a great offensive line, so I don't expect it. Um, this is going to be a good offense. So Sanders should get a lot of early down work. I don't know what the pass catching work is going to be. He's always been an athletic player, explosive player with a lot of upside on a play-to-play -play basis, but a lot of the moving parts are up in the air, pass catching, goal line, all that shit. But he could be the starter in a good offense. And that's the case I want to make for him. But because he's hurt me so badly in the past, you know, it's like the ex-girlfriend where you need to be you know, you got to be faded 2 a.m. to make that you up text. That's like kind of what I need for Miles Sanders. So if we're happen to be drafting late night, you know, one of our drafts kicks off at midnight and I'm in my bag, Miles Sanders going to end up on my team, unfortunately. There's a couple guys at the end of this list that I'm not, you know, I don't really know where to stand on them because I all three of them are like dynamite players. They've they've 
kind of proven that to me already. Maybe not this first guy. So Rashad Bateman is the first of the three that I'm talking about right now, but like the fifth on this list. I'm not really sure why. I made multiple lists within lists. Rashad Bateman scares me because of what I've been preaching for the last few videos about how the Baltimore Ravens offense was so slow and so run heavy prior to last year when all their running backs got hurt. If their running backs are healthy this year, which also is a toss up, I don't know, which is why I'm kind of torn on Bateman right now. They're going to be very run heavy if they have the running backs to do so. So I think like buying into Rashad Bateman is almost like buying into what Hollywood Brown was prior to last year when he had 145 fucking targets. All right. And, and we'll mix and match here because Hollywood was good the year before, but because he had that deep playability where he was catching 50, 60 yard bombs from Lamar Jackson, a lot of times dropping him. But when he did catch him, it was big. And Rashad Bateman is not going to be that guy for, for this offense. He's not going to be the speedster downfield catching 60 yard Hail Marys, man. And as much as we love Bateman, I think what Hollywood did in 2020 is like a very reasonable projection for. Bateman statistically because he didn't do anything his rookie year. Most players, you know, there are Jamar Chase, there are Justin Jefferson. Most players don't go from zero to 1300 in a year. Most players go from like zero to 750, zero to 800. And that's fine. But like Bateman's going to keep rising in the ADPs because people are going to get more and more excited about him. I'm not really like going above my fucking skis to draft a guy that might have 900 receiving yards. Like Best case scenario, what Hollywood did in 2020, 100 targets, 58 catches, 769 yards and eight touchdowns. OK, so a few of those statistics, like 100 targets, I think is realistic, maybe a little bit more. He'll have more than 58 catches because he has better hands and he'll have a uh, you know a shorter a dot. So they're easier balls to catch. But the yardage came from a lot of deep plays from Marquise Hollywood Brown. Eight touchdowns, that might be generous too. I think Rashad Bateman could end up with like six touchdowns maybe because again, a lot of those were deep balls, a little mix and match here with the statistics, but I think like 70 and 806 touchdowns is very believable for Bateman. And it's hard for me to buy into a ceiling that's like much, much higher than that. I think there's, you know, a range of outcomes where he catches 90 to 95 passes if for whatever reason they continue to do a high passing volume relative to what they've been attack going forward, but I'm not confident in that. So I think Bateman's range of outcomes is high, but if I had to put money on it, I would go towards the lower range of outcomes. I just love him as a fucking talent. He's one of my favorite players coming out of college two years ago. So I'd like to draft him, but I'm probably going to need to be a little drunk. And same thing with Amon Ross St. Brown, man. This is too hard of a pick for me to make. I'm just not courageous enough for it. The case for him was easy. He was just fucking awesome as a rookie, but the case against him is probably easier. He had a, a limited sample size of being really good, admittedly, but it was all while these guys were hurt. Hawkinson, DeAndre Swift. I mean, he was de he was competing with real shit players for targets last year. And now they draft a wide receiver in the first round to be the alpha. I, and Jamison Williams is not necessarily going to come in and command targets right away because he's coming back from an injury. But I think it speaks to the mindset of the team in that they're not looking to build the offense around Amon Ross St. Brown. Okay, And that might dictate the game plan, and that might dictate him not getting nine targets a game now with Hawkinson and Swift back on the field um, and DJ Chark coming in as well, right? He's going to play a role and he's going to grab some targets from it. And he's still playing with Jared Goff, man. I know he played well with Jared Goff last year, but clean slate, starting a new season again, you don't want your wide receivers playing with Jared Goff as the quarterback. So I'm around Elijah Moore, very similar in fantasy for me, like very similar situations. Moore is a better separator, but they're both kind of like murky situations where you're investing into a quarterback that we have no idea whether or not that dude is good at all. Okay. So Amon Ra is someone that I'm very hesitant to put stock into. Same thing with Kyle Pitts, man. I'm a Falcons fan. I love Kyle Pitts. But what can we really expect with Marcus Mariota under center? This offense is going to be terrible. They don't have an offensive line. They don't have a running game. They have a quarterback. I don't even know if you consider Marcus Mariota a quarterback at this point. It's going to be really ugly in Atlanta this year. And you add Drake London in, so you have a legitimate outside wide receiver who's going to take a pretty significant target share. Kyle Pitts should be, listen, he had a great rookie year, but realistically, he had like a huge chunk of his statistics in three games against really shit defenses. So I think he becomes more consistent this year, but this offense caps the ceiling for everything. So I want to believe that Kyle Pitts just came off an incredible 21, 22 year old rookie year and only bright things are ahead. But I think like the ceiling for what Kyle Pitts is going to be, which he's going to hit that in a few years. I think we're still a couple of years off of that. I think this offense needs to get itself together before Kyle Pitts's fantasy career gets itself to where we need it to be. So Kyle Pitts, sure. Like if he's on my team, I'm not going to complain about it, but I'm not using like a third early fourth round pick on Kyle Pitts at tight end. Unless, unless we have a lot of that, unless you see that bottle half empty next video, maybe Kyle Pitts is on my team, but that's it. All right. That's the video for today. I, uh, if you're watching this, I'm probably drunk right now because I'm in Austin, Texas for a bachelor party. I will be bike. I'm not putting out a video for Saturday. 
Um, Noah's got Sunday. I'll be back Monday, though. So we will reconvene then. And make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new here. Make sure you hit the thumbs up button, all that kind of shit. Make sure you download Prize Picks to get our draft guide, though. Prize Picks, use promo code BDG. We deposit $10 or more, and we will hit y'all with an email giving you access. That is it. Let's go get drunk. Thank <laughs> you.